Thanks for joining us for our CTS Sunday interview special. My name is Jacqueline Phillips. I'm your co-host today. I'm jo with Joey Lozada and the special guest, Tony Ortega. Thanks for having us. Wow. You've done this before, haven't you? I was in a Walmart commercial. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the CTS interview room. We got a very special guest, Tony Ortega. You may have seen him on uh, Netflix. Actually, that's where I'm seeing him right now because I'm watching the Leah uh, Remy Amy Ebony. special. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, uh, I guess, it was on a couple years back. But I'm just now watching it. And then you also can watch him on Going Clear. Uh, Tony, you've been. Well, first off, how are you doing today? See, I'm I'm a rookie at this too. How are you doing today? Thanks, thanks for having me on, Joey. I'm really happy to be here. Okay. Everything's great. Uh, well, I'm happy that you're here too, because uh, like I said, I've been watching this stuff on Scientology, and it's like, wow, people are really stupid. <laughs> I can't believe it. I just don't understand it. So how, let me ask you a question. How did you get started in this uh, fruity little science club they call Scientology? <laughs> well, I've never been a Scientologist. I was never in Scientology. Uh, I'm just a journalist. Uh, I grew up in LA. I ended up writing for a newspaper in Phoenix, Arizona of all places and uh, ran into a, a Scientology story there. And I was very fortunate that I worked for a company that allowed a reporter to kind of develop an expertise over time. And I just kept coming back to Scientology stories. Um, I, the company moved me around quite a bit. I ended up the editor-in-chief of the Village Voice in New York in 2007. And uh, a couple of years later, I, I was writing uh, more and more about Scientology. I finally decided to make it a daily beat because it was really great for the website. It was just, you know, people are fascinated by Scientology. And so I've been writing, uh, I left The Voice in 2012 to write a book, started my own website, The Underground Bunker, TonyOrtega.org. And I've been writing uh, as a beat reporter on Scientology every day for almost 10 years now. So it's, it's just a story that's fascinating. It's fun. I, I love being on the front lines. And, uh, and there's a new story on our website every morning at 7 a.m. Now, man. I'm gonna tell you a little something about my background. I got in my family, both on my dad's side and my mom's side. I got four, all based on Christianity. My mom's side is Pentecostal and Southern Baptist, if you will. On my dad's side is Jehovah Witness and Catholic. Now I've been to mass. I've been to the Kingdom Hall. I've been to church, and I've been to, or in, to church. I guess Pentecostal and Baptist, Southern Baptist call it church, church. Uh, with that said, uh, would you consider Scientology the, one of the most expensive religions ever in the history of religions? Well, it's, you know, other churches can be very expensive as well, except that one of the big differences is Scientology actually has a price list. I mean, it literally has a price list if you want to do anything in a church, any kind of a service. Um, you know, whereas, you know, obviously when you go to a Christian church that, you know, they pass around the, the collection plate and, and you're encouraged to, to make donations, but, you know, you're not asked to, you know, pay the minister or priest or rabbi every time he goes up and gives a, a homily or a sermon, you know, it's, it's, it's very different. The other big difference, all those things you mentioned, um, you know, you, you go to the Kingdom Hall, you go to a Christian church, you're going to a group event, right? It's, it's, in a, it's in a large hall, 
You have a large group of people. You have a spiritual guide, a, a, a priest or a minister, go up in front and, and give some sort of a, a lecture, a sermon, a homily. And, and what is it usually about? It's about something that's in the holy book, something that maybe happened a couple thousand years ago. It's a shared experience of a group of, of people. Scientology could not be more different. Scientology is not about a group. Scientology is about you and your auditor. And your auditor is asking you question after question after question, not about some shared experience, not about some holy book. They're asking you about you. This is what's very attractive to some people about Scientology is they have this idea that you actually have this amazing galactic narrative inside of you, that you're actually trillions of years old, that this is only the current lifetime you're in, and that Scientology is going to help by, by questioning you and questioning you. It's going to help you remember those millions and billions of years that you've actually lived on other planets, in galactic wars, and all kinds of crazy stuff that comes not from a book, not from a group. It comes only from you. So that's the big, big difference. It's just that one-on-one -on -one experience most of the time. So you're basically saying that I can come, I can say right now I'm from the planet Igloo. And that's my faith. And, and, and they have a rule that the auditor, the person questioning you and asking you to remember what happened five million years ago, if you say, well, I was the leader of the planet Igloo, they literally have a rule. They can't correct you. They can't tell you, no, that's probably not true. No, that's, hmm. that's against the rules. They have to accept what you say. And, you know, a lot oh. of Scientologists, Scientologists will believe that what they're saying is true, but... When they come out and they talk to me, they said, I realized I was just sort of dreaming it up. None of it was true. But at the time, the Scientologist auditor takes it seriously. And then they have this machine. You're holding the sensors of this machine. And the machine appears to, to confirm what you're saying. So it might sound what? ridiculous. I was, I was the leader of the planet Igloo. But the auditor says, OK, I believe you. And the machine says, you're telling the truth. And so it becomes a very powerful indoctrination tool to convincing people that they actually experience these things. Let me ask you uh, a question. Uh, have you ever seen another religion so cut through? I mean, I've seen my preacher. I've seen some preachers. I'm not, I'm not saying my preacher, but I've seen preachers get mad when you don't tie. <laughs> I've heard sermons where at least every Sunday is about tithing. But I have never seen a religion this cutthroat because I'm a private investigator and it, I pride myself knowing, you know, knowing if my subject or my claimant is not knowing I'm there. These private investigators, right. they 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 want you to know you're there. I'm, I don't understand it because that's not my way. I do things. I want to be, you know, under the radar. Well, you know, what's interesting, Joey, is that that, yes, for a long time. Um, it's been obvious that they, they do what's called noisy investigations, where the private investigator wants you to know that you're being followed, whether you're an ex-member who is, who is revealing some of their secrets, or you're a journalist or government official. They will put some very noisy investigators out there to make sure you know that you're in their crosshairs. But they also have another set of investigators that, that do their best to make sure you don't know you're being followed. We, we, that's something we learned more recently uh, in the last, I don't know, nine or 10 years. Uh, I've actually spoken to some of these investigators who, who said, yeah, their number one job was the person you're following cannot know they're being followed. So Scientology does both. But yeah, you're right. It's a very vindictive organization, a very paranoid investigation. Inside Scientology, it's a, it's a culture of snitching. I mean, you're encouraged to snitch on other Scientologists, even if that means snitching on your own parents, snitching on your own children, you know, that they encourage that. And um, Leah Remini has talked about how she used to turn her husband in all the time because he would do something against the rules. And Scientologists are under so much pressure to follow these really Byzantine business-like rules. They know that if you don't turn in your wife for watching Leah Remini or, or committing some other infraction, and they find out that you knew she had done it, then you'll be punished just as hard as, as she is. So they're all very paranoid about, I better turn people in or I'm gonna get in trouble myself. So it's just this really scary environment where everyone's watching everyone else 
And again, they have this machine that I will tell you is, is just a very poor uh, tool for what they think they're doing with it, but they're convinced it reads their minds. And as long as they're convinced that it reads their minds, it is a fabulous interrogation tool because they feel that they, they believe that they can't hide any secrets. And as, this is one thing Mark Headley has told me, there are no secrets in Scientology. You spill your guts about everything all the time. And Scientology is really, really obsessed, not only with um, whether you're you know, doing all the Scientology things you're supposed to be doing, but they want to know every detail of your sex life of, through your entire life. They want to know names. I mean, just stuff that a church has no business asking about. Scientology is obsessed with it. This makes actually a really good segue for a question that I have. Is, so Dianetics was packaged as, you know, the mental health cure. This was, we're going to, you know, rebuild you. We're going to manage your trauma. And, you know, the, the, the thetans that they work out, you know, a lot of it represents similarly to EMDR processing. And it's about, you know, repurposing your trauma and managing it and manifesting so that you can move more forward with it. They were so close to getting it right, but then they went and perverted it so much. You know, how... How do you think they were able to take something that was a Bergonian science and was actually useful and then just, you know, manipulate it so poorly? Right. And, and you know, let's, let's real, be real quick, go through, over what's different between Dianetics and Scientology, because there's a difference. Dianetics came first, and you're right, the, the basic concept in Dianetics uh, is that it, you've been through a trauma in your life. And the best way to get over it is to talk about it and to sort of re-experience it and not over and over and over. And it be the trauma becomes less and less and less until you can joke about it. There's absolutely science to that. There's ab I mean, this is the basis of all talking cures, right? That, you know, if you've got problems in your life, you should talk about it. And I would say that most of the people who will tell you that they enjoyed the first parts of Scientology that's what they're talking about is that there is nothing wrong with sitting down with somebody who's curious about you and asks about your life and your childhood and everything. The problem is that from the beginning, L. Ron Hubbard wrapped it up in a bunch of complete lunacy that the traumatic incidents in your life are stored in the protoplasm of your cells, that most the most important traumas you went through occurred while you were a fetus in your mother's womb and your mom and dad had rough sex. And this is why 40 years later, you're having problems in your life because of those memories when you were a fetus. So he puts, he takes some, he, and one of the things Hubbard always did was steal from a lot of other people. And as much as he made fun of Freud and made fun of psychoanalysis, he was clearly stealing some of those ideas that sit down with somebody and talk about your problems and you'll probably feel a little better. So, <clears throat> and so that's what Diane, and, and you're right. The, the Dianetics was pitched as a science. The cover of that book says Dianetics, the modern science of mental health. And initially that's what he told people he was selling a science, but uh, and there's a great scene in The Master. I don't know if you've seen The Master. Um, it, I, I, it's not the greatest film. It's a little slow, but there's a wonderful scene where they show people reenacting being born. And that's what was popular in 1950 when he first came out with this, is people believed, if I could just remember what I went through when I was in mom's you know, womb, then it'll help me today. Well, some people weren't satisfied with only going back to their their you know, fetal uh, time. They wanted to go back further. They believed in previous lives. And that's what Scientology is. It, it goes into this fantasy where you can remember what happened to you thousands or millions of years ago. And uh, that's where it just gets really divorced from any kind of science. And it's just crazy. So that's the, that's the difference between Dianetics and Scientology is Scientology, you're trying to remember what happened to you on another planet a million years ago. And, and the goal of all this is if you can just remember your actual lifetimes going back millions and billions and even trillions of years, you will recover godlike powers. I mean, he literally says in a, in a, in a lecture 
when you get to the, they're called operating Satan levels, the OT levels, when, when you've recovered trillions of years of memories, when you get to the OT level of power, you could literally crush a planet between thumb and forefinger. That's what Hubbard was talking about. He was selling godhood, okay? Like a lot of some of these, you know, new age type of movements of the peer, of that period, but they just don't, well, one of the, the you know, I, I think one of the things Joey was kind of getting at is one of the number one rules in Scientology is you can't talk about this stuff. You know, you can't tell outsiders that that's what we're doing is recovering memories from a million years ago so we can become gods. Instead, they just say, well, you should get the book. It'll help you in your life. Tom Cruise, John Travolta, they're trained. That's all they're ever supposed to say. They're not supposed to talk about past life therapy and that kind of thing. So, you know, we, we did have a bunch of religions kind of coming out at the same time as Scientology. We had Harry Krishna, you know, moving forward. We had Waco and, you know, this, this Messiah complex. What do you think is the root cause behind these people that assume that Messiah complex? What, what disease do they have that gives them that autonomy? <laughs> You know, there's actually uh, some good work by people tracing things back further to the 19th century and Madame Blavatsky. And, and uh, there's been a real interesting study that um, Scientology goes back to the Gnostic uh, traditions of, of antiquity. You know, um, there's always been this kind of, you know, are we, are we really just these very, um, basically just animals that, that have a, a few more you know, abilities in our brains? Or are we like really gods that are fallen on this planet and we need to get in touch with this larger? And so some of these ideas have actually been around for thousands of years, but you're right. There was a proliferation of these kinds of ideas in that, in that mid-century era. Um, I guess something to do with World War II being over. Uh, it's been pointed out numerous times that Hubbard's timing was brilliant time and again, he, the way he was pitching Scientology, there was a very fertile atmosphere for that in the post-war period. And then it got kind of repackaged again for the 60s and the 70s. Um, and it's funny because, you know, you think about sort of these movements you're talking about, you tend to think of hippies, you tend to think of new age. Scientology is nothing like that at all. It's kind of a business cult. You know, it's like they fed it, they have a fetish for business rules. It's a, it's a very strange combination of things. But um no, I mean, you're, you're asking a great question about why all these movements sort of came out at the same time. Do they have things in common? That's, that's uh, I tend to focus only on Scientology. I wish I had a better answer for you than I do. No, that's fair. I, I do agree, though, that, you know, Scientology and Dianetics were sort of sold as like an MLM. And that's an interesting way to take a, a religion as opposed to others. Right. It's always been about business. I mean, people ask me, you know, okay, they don't have a God. You're supposed to be a God. They, they deny that L. Ron Hubbard is their God. So what do they worship? And I always say money. <laughs> well, that, you know, you, you made a very good point because uh, I really do believe that kids come out, you know, depressed and sad if during their parents' sex life, because honestly, while my wife was pregnant, she had a lot of good sex. And all three of my kids came out very happy. So I just want to go ahead and make that. I think Scientology is on to something. Uh, do you think Scientology used these things that I saw on, uh, going clear in the Netflix series, sex checks? Do you think people worry about the stuff, the information that they give to Scientology and they use it for blackmail? Absolutely. There's no question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember one time um, in the uh, Scientology in the aftermath, um, they used to be more cagey about it. They've gotten more brazen about it now. There was a really excellent episode about um, the ideal org grift and how they get uh, these members to give over so much money to help them build these new buildings that they really don't need. And they had um, a couple of gentlemen on, Paul Burkhart, and Bert Shippers came on that episode and gave great testimony about what they had been through. And then Scientology went on one of their smear websites and just totally smeared one of these guys. And I talked to him about it and it was material he had given up 
in these interrogations that supposedly are confidential. So, I mean, and this was stuff that they were like sending out to the networks. I mean, you know, they're no longer shy about this at all. Absolutely. When you're in Scientology, you are always being asked to give these really uh, brutal interrogations and give up all kinds of private information. And they are writing it all down. And this is why most people who leave Scientology never speak out about it because they know if they go on Leah's show or if they talk to the press that on some website somewhere, not necessarily obviously tied to the church, this really damaging private information will show up. And we've seen it time and time again. Scientology denies they do it, but I've caught them numerous times. They use that material against people that they interrogate while they're church members. No question. Oh, that brings me to my next question. You've been very outspoken against this church. I don't really like to call it the church. I call it a free little science club. It is what it is. But uh, what have they done to you? Yeah, they, they, they treat me the way they do a lot of these people. They're always smearing me. And um, they've, they've run some elaborate operations against my wife. Uh, trying See, they, you know, I, I send them emails asking them for comment on these stories. I'd actually prefer if they called me up and said, listen, we disagree with this story. I'd, I'd be happy to put their statement in my stories to, you know, give their point of view. But what they do instead is they go around and they try, I mean, they've, they've tried to intimidate my mother twice. They send a private investigator to my mother's house. Um, they've tried numerous times to get my wife fired from her job by, by spreading lies about her. I mean, it's just really disgusting stuff. I'm very fortunate that both my wife and my mother are very tough and they like what I'm, and they believe what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, and they're always telling lies about me online. It's just, it just comes with the territory. I, you know, I always say that they spent, and they spend so much money doing it. They spent, they send private investigators all around the world to try and intimidate people who are close to Leah Remini, close to Mike Rinder, close to me. And I've always said, if they weren't doing it to me, I'd feel kind of left out. You know, they're always going after Mike and Leah. But it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a uh, part of the hazard of the occupation. I just try to ignore it the most, I, the best I can. Yeah, you know, as a private investigator, and I saw, I heard how much money these private investigators were making, and I was like, maybe put my resume in. <laughs> uh, second, thing, <laughs> uh, second thing is, uh, this is not really a question; it's more based on comment. And I want to see what you think. Uh, how do you, I mean, I know people get brainwashed. Uh, people, there's an argument right now that the media brainwashes people. There's, a, I mean, we saw with the Jones back in the 70s. We saw different types of cults, you know, drinking Kool-Aid, going off to space. You know, how do you feel? How, what do you think? I guess this is a question. Why do you think people are falling for this? And I, I say it respectfully. So, nah, not really. Why do you think people fall for this? Well, you no, know, that's a good question. I mean, it, it can look so ridiculous from the outside. And I definitely at my website, I, I do a lot of quoting of L. Ron Hubbard, which most publications don't, because I want to show people just how crazy a lot of it is. And um, one of the things they do, uh, and this is a very deliberate, it's, it's, it's in their policies. They will approach you and find what they call your ruin. They will look for what you is vulnerable in your life. So, you know, we've all been at low points in our lives after a breakup, after we lose a job, whatever, that's when Scientology will approach you. And, and keep in mind, it's it, most people want to have nothing to do with it, but a small number of people what Scientology offers is this. Life is a mystery. Life is scary. Life has all kinds of bumps in the road. And we, you and I know there's no owner's manual to the human being. We just, we're just all doing our best in, in a confusing time. Scientology comes to you, though, and says, that's not true at all. We, know, we have all the answers. We have all the certainty. Now, that, that doesn't appeal to me. I, I hear that, and I assume it's a con, Right. But there are a small number of people that, that want to hear that, that there's a group that has the answers, 
that knows what they're talking about, that are going to be able to help you with whatever problem you have. And they look for that thing that's made you especially vulnerable, whether it's a breakup or a money problem. And they work on that and they push it. They call it, they find your ruin. And then, so because I've talked to some really intelligent people that got into Scientology, but they'll tell me, well, you know, I had just been through a breakup. I was really depressed. I didn't know what was going on in my life. And these people came and said, you know, we want you to be with us. We've got all the answers. We'll help you out. And like I said, that doesn't work with most people, but a small percentage say, you know what, I could, I'll I'll check this out. And then it's a, it's a, it's a process of indoctrination. They show you a couple little tricks at first that seem to be useful uh, as far as focusing your attention on what you're doing. Um, They're literally staring contests is how it starts out. They just want you to be able to sit and stare for hours at a time. And for some people that helps their concentration, that helps their focus. And they think, Hey, these guys do know something. And so then it becomes a process of getting deeper and deeper and deeper in. And and, and at first also, it's not very expensive. That first course is only going to cost you 50 bucks. Now, 10 years later, you're nearly a million dollars in, you're still chasing the top secrets they've been promising you you completely turned your life over to it. You've cut everyone out of your life that's not in it. And suddenly it's like, it's too late. You know, even if you have doubts, the thought of all the money you've wasted, all the people you've lost, trying to, you know, it becomes really, really difficult to get out at that point. And Scientology is very much meticulously planned to bring people down into that trap. I I mean, I've talked to people that have read my site or seen Leah's show. And they're like, you know what? I'm going to go check it out for myself. I, I you know, I, I'm sure it's, you know, not what they say. I'm, I'm going to be going real skeptical. And then I'll hear from them like three or four years later, say they sucked me in. I went in skeptical. I knew what you guys were saying about it and they still got them. So it's just not something to mess with because they, they've really built up this process of getting past people's barriers uh, uh, taking advantage of their vulnerabilities and making them go after this thing that's always one step farther ahead. They can never quite get to that point where they've learned all the secrets and they're masters of their own, you know, uh, lives. It's it's really insidious. So Scientology sort of hit its stride in the '80s and '90s and 2000s, but it it started so much further back. Do you think that, you know, given today's 24-hour news cycle and social media and the World Wide Web, do you think if they had tried to launch today, they would have the success that they currently have? That's a good question because um, it is much tougher for them today because the word is out and the secrets are out and it's harder for them to recruit. Google Um, exists. Google exists. (laughs) But I think, you know, we look around and there are some, very illogical movements that have grown very quickly in the last couple of years. And you wonder, well, these are not only uh, in the presence of the internet, they're, they're fueled by the internet. So, uh, you know, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Part of the problem with Scientology was very resistant to the internet at first. Um, They're using it now and the, the, all the Scientologists are online, like the rest of us now but they were late to, to get it. And then, um, you know, how, see, and part of their problem is that everything is based on L. Ron Hubbard, a man who died in 1986 before the internet even started. And Hubbard was all, his, all of his instructions are sell books, sell courses, do things on paper. And so all these years later, they're still doing all that. You know, I mean, even the, even today, their files are paper files and, they, they, they still believe that the key is convincing people to buy books. So it's, it, in that way, it's difficult for Scientology to survive now because they, they're so resistant to change. If Hubbard didn't talk about doing this, then they're not going to do it, you know. So it, it's really sort of uh, caught in amber. It's, it's a very strange organization that way. So we have an organization that's caught in amber. We've got a beat reporter who's been investigating it for well into the you know two decades you've had other topics that you've investigated deeply i love that you went after joe arpaio uh too much of my tax money has gone to his case with no resolve 
um, you know, what is what is the zenith for you with this? Where where do you see yourself taking this? What is your goal of doing this over and over right. and over again? Um, well, a big highlight for me was writing my book about Paul Cooper. And um, um, I have similar projects I'm working on you know, long term. Um, but the sort of the nature of being giving myself the job of beat reporter is, um, you know, you don't know where it's going. You're just day after day looking at these different. So there's a lot of court cases going on right now that I'm keeping on on several different court cases at the same time. Um, what, you know, yeah, you're right. It's, it's a good question because people are always asking me, when is this thing going to come down? I'm like, that's not my job. That's not, I'm not, I'm not an activist. I'm not trying to bring the church of Scientology down. I'm just reporting on what the Scientology does, whatever it does, good or bad. And, and, um, and to me, that's satisfying. And now where, <laughs> how long I can do that? That's a good question. I'm not sure, but it, I'm still going pretty strong at this point. I guess but, I'm wondering if there's a goal in mind that you have for this culmination of work. Yeah, I'd like to see Paulette's story done in some other ways besides my book. And I've looked into some, you know, things about that and looking at some other projects. Um, you know, it was, I was just very fortunate to be on Going Clear and I'd like to be involved in some other things like that. Um, but, you know, Leah's done an amazing job. I was fortunate to be on her show. But even with Leah Remini bringing the consciousness of the country up on this, this government still hasn't done a thing. So I guess that's one of the things I'm curious about is, is the government ever going to step in and look at this tax exempt status, look at the fact that families are being ripped apart, uh, look at these allegations that people are making. So that's something that keeps me interested is I, I feel like I do, I do hear that there are government agencies that are interested, but it's always a question of whether they're really going to make a move. It's not just money though, Jacqueline. It's also, you know, Mike Rinder explained it really well. He said, the thing is, if you're some middle manager at, at, at an agency trying to decide whether to, to, you know, pull the trigger and charge Scientology, you have to figure that's going to be the rest of your career because you're going to be fighting that for 10 or 15 years. The Scientology never gives an inch. They put, they have an unlimited litigation uh, budget and they, they, you know, it's interesting when you, you know, when I'm covering their cases, because, I, you know, a new attorney will come along and say, I'm going to sue the church Scientology. Like, are you sure you know what you're doing? And you, you watch them as they, they can't believe what they're going through because Scientology fights every little step that in other cases, they were just like, okay, we'll get past that. Let's get to the next thing. No, Scientology contests everything. So it's, it's don't explain. It's just you know attacking for attacking sake, and and but so that's what Heber Hubbard told them to do. Yeah. Again, they're just working from his playbook that the purpose of a lawsuit is not to win. The purpose of a lawsuit is to drag it out so long that the other person goes bankrupt. I mean, he literally said that, and that's what you see Scientology doing time and time again. You know, you talked about the police stepping in and I got the one million dollar question that everybody wants to know. Where where is Shirley? Shirley? Where is Shirley? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Get where, where the hell is she at? OK, yeah. you know, because where I'm from in Alabama, when you go missing, we, we look for you. <laughs> that, that's oh. just something new here in Alabama. I don't know how y'all do it, you know, in the West Coast. But here, if you go I missing. Know. And we nobody has ever seen you again. We look for you. It's shocking. So, it's shocking. Well, yeah, tell Shelley. Me what's going on with that? Sure, Shelly Miscavige uh, is the wife of David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology, and they were um, they met in the Sea Org, and they married at the base back in I think it was eighty one or eighty two. I can't remember. And uh, for the next uh, uh, 20 years, she was a top executive along with him. I mean, they ran Scientology together and they always went places together, everywhere they went together. And then uh, in 2005, Mike Rinder and some others I've talked to noticed that there were some funny things going on that, that indicated this relationship was not going so well. And Dave went, to, they, they lived on a base about 90 miles east of LA near a place called Hemet, California. 
very secretive base. For many years, people didn't even know what it was out there. They were very, very quiet. And uh, in, two, in the summer of 2005, Dave went to LA to work on this publishing project and she stayed back at the base. And people that were there at the time told me that was unusual. They didn't usually spend time apart. While he was gone, he took care, she took care of some things that he had never gotten around to that was bugging everybody. He came back, saw that she had taken some initiative on her own to do some things, and he blew his stack. I have eyewitnesses to this. He just went nuts. He went back to L.A. Um, this took me a while to get the details on this, but uh, very, I think a very sad thing, but also in, in indicative of, of that she knows what she's up against. She then took a car from the base and drove to L.A. to try to save her marriage and failed. Came back, and it's only a then that they packed her into a car and drove her away and nobody's seen her since in the 15 years since then. The only time she was seen after that, that was August, September, 2005. Two years later, they let her out to go to the funeral of her father in the summer of 2007. And that's it. Now I know where they've been keeping her. Um, the, so the base that she was at where she was living with Dave is called Int Base or Gold Base. And that's where the hole is where they do have a kind of prison for some of their executives, but she was never in the hole. She left, she disappeared from the place that has the hole. So a lot of times you'll see people online say, oh, she must be in the hole. No, she left from the place that has the hole. There's a smaller compound about 60 miles away up in the mountains, in the San Bernardino mountains, that is the headquarters for a subsidiary, a super secret subsidiary of Scientology called the Church of Spiritual Technology. In that little base, a little compound up in the mountains, there's only 12 or 15 people. And that, that little subsidiary has a very strange mission. Their job is to preserve the words and writings of L. Ron Hubbard to last thousands of years in case there's some sort of civilization collapse or nuclear war or whatever. So they, in that base up in the mountains, in San Bernardino Mountains, they do the work of putting his work, his, like for example, they will take a book of his and transfer the words onto steel plates and seal them in titanium boxes. And then they have a vault. It's not deep. It's just, you know, underground a little bit where they put these racks full of, of, of you know, lectures, uh, films it, put on special me uh, media to last literally thousands of years. So they have four of those vaults. There's three in California and one in New Mexico, but all the work of doing, of getting that material ready is done at that one little compound in the mountains above LA. And there's multiple lines of evidence that convinced me she's been there that whole 15 years. Just kept out of sight. Just, and, and we, you know, Mike Rinder found some really excellent evidence that they have armed guards outside that base to make sure she cannot leave. And, you know, the question always comes up, is she resigned to her fate? I, I think she probably is. But a couple of things have happened over the last 15 years that convinced me she knows she's a prisoner. She knows she's being punished. She knows her husband is keeping her there as a prisoner. And I think there might, might be a chance that given, a, given the opportunity, she might want to leave. But even her own family has been unable to get law enforcement to check on her for them. This is how much the Church of Scientology has these law enforcement agencies terrorized and cowed. Uh, it's, it's really stunning. I myself have made attempts to get through to the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office and say, listen, this family just wants to check on her. Why can't you just check on her? And they won't do it. They won't do it. David Miscavige has gotten away with banishing his wife to a small mountain compound for 15 years and nobody does anything about it. I just think it's an insane situation. And it's really a shame that I, the only news organization that has ever taken me up there so I can show them around and we could actually knock on the door. They didn't answer. The only news organization with that kind of guts had to come all the way from Australia. I've never been asked to do that from ABC or CBS or CNN None, none of the American networks care. It's just, I, I just find it amazing that David Miscavige has gotten away with this for 15 years. Well, you know, here, here's, here's the thing. In reality, 
nobody's really forcing you to stay there. And hear me out on this because, I mean, you know more about this than I do. But you put yourself in that predicament. And once somebody tells, like, say, I, okay, let's say I'm at church and my pastor says, hey, you need to go to the hole. That's when I go, you know, you can, you, and I won't, I respect my pastor too much. But uh, let's say J- Jacqueline's pastor told me I had to go to the hole. I'm going to tell him to kiss my ass. Okay, that's so. It's your you got to take some self responsibility for your you know responsibility for oneself because nobody's forcing you to go to the hole. You can take your ass out of the fucking hole anytime you want to. Just fucking say, "Hey, I'm leaving," and then they try to stop you. Guess what? Then you can press charges when they put the hands on you. I I mean I'm just. This is just a layman. I'm, I'm, no, I'm I, I understand what you're saying. I know it's difficult to understand that mentality. Um, people, in a, sort of a similar situation is the fact that Miscavige has been accused of beating up on the people that work for him, and he's five foot one. And people always yeah. ask. People always ask me, "You got this little five foot one guy wailing at you with his fist? Why don't they just level him with a with an uppercut?" You know, and it's Mike Rinder, Mike Rinder. And Jefferson Hawkins have explained that, okay, but imagine you're, you've been in the military virtually your entire life and you've totally bought into everything that your unit is all about. And then for some reason, the absolute top commander, the general, whatever, comes up and just starts pummeling the hell out of you. Are you really going to take a swing at a general? I mean, maybe somebody would, but it's just that mentality that it's so, it's such a, it, you're so indoctrinated to accept anything you're told, what to do, any punishment you're given. Uh, Mike Rinder was actually in the hole for a while. And he said, yeah. what, what kind of keeps you there is that you're always hoping, well, today maybe Miscavige will realize I really am loyal and he'll let me out and forget these other guys. You know, they're, they're, they're creeps, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it out of here. And it's just that hope that keeps you from doing something really overt, like trying to run away or beat up people. It's uh, and, and as 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 Mike and, and and Lawrence Wright have explained, the bars are in your head. This is what makes it so difficult for somebody. And then at this point, I mean, they, you know, Mike reported, you know, that they actually have armed guards at this little remote mountain compound, which has high fences and razor wire. And this, they we're talking about. And at this point, Shelley is sixty years old and may not be doing very well. So I'm not sure how much of a prison break she's up for at this point. My, my last question is simply this, is David dating? No, that's a serious question. I'm not being No, funny no, that is a serious this. question because, um, you know, it took a while for some people to realize Shelly was gone. Um, I've, I've been able to pinpoint um, her disappearance to like late August, early September, 2005. Uh-huh. You, hear, you hear 2006 sometimes from people. But um, it's it's I, I verify with people that it was 2005. And the reason why I think some people think it was 2006 is it took a while before people realized she was missing because you didn't always see the same people at the same time. Anyway, in 2006 was when Tom Cruise and Katie Holmes got married in that castle in Italy, and uh, Leah Remini was invited, and Leah had always considered Shelley to be one of her friends, and this is when she first noticed more than a year after Shelley had disappeared. Leah realized that Dave was there as Tom Cruise's best man without Shelly. And not only was Shelly not at the wedding of the century, but that Dave was being really friendly with his assistant. And in Scientology, they call it the communicator. Her, her name is Lou Steckenbrock. And Leah has talked about this. She put it in her book that he, that Miscavige was very handsy with her. And this is why he was like, she was really upset. Like, where's your wife? You know, and that's when she first asked about it and was told that she didn't have the effing rank to even ask that question. And it started her path out of Scientology was the shock she experienced at that event. But that was one of the, you know, uh, Leah is not the only person who has suggested that David had something going on with his assistant. But that was, what, 16 years ago now? So I don't know what Dave is up to at this point. I really don't. Well, you know, you talk about him putting, you know, putting his hands on people. You know, I can understand 
what exactly what you're saying because it's been times with me where I allowed someone to say something to me and I'm thinking back and I like an hour later like why did I let that mother you know you understand what I'm saying yeah. it's that shock factor like yeah. and but I can understand that but that's only going to happen one time right right I don't care how I mean I'm not I'm please don't take me for a tough guy um, I, I'm not a tough guy I'm just telling you how the way I feel you get me one time, but the second time, no, it's not going to happen. You can't, especially your five foot one. I will whoop your ass. I don't care if you know Kung Fu, Taekwondo. At five foot one, you're going to get your ass whooped. It just, it's just fact. So, you know, I, it's, it's hard to understand. And, and that's why if you really want to try to understand, you have to see the whole picture of that they've been indoctrinated since they were children. I mean, because a lot of these Sea Org people were born into it. They weren't recruited off the street somewhere. Um, their entire lives have been built up in this idea that Scientology is this planet's only hope and that, uh, you know, they're part of this incredible mission that only a f elite few people, and they consider themselves a superior species to the rest of us, literally a superior species. We have the secrets. We are the, sa we're saving the planet we're, you know, the privileged few. We're going to have to work really hard and around the clock, but it's all worth it. We're going to salvage this planet. And you're all on board and you're, you're completely dedicated and you have no sleep and everything. And then all of a sudden the leader comes up and slugs you. You know, it, it, it's easy to say, well, forget all this. I walk away. Because, I mean, I know you would and I would, but it's really hard for these people that have grown up in it their whole lives, their entire families are in, they're, they're completely invested that this Scientology thing is the truth and is the greatest thing ever. And it's just really hard for them to just walk away. And I know it's difficult to understand. See, this is the other thing I always hear is people always assume that, well, Tom Cruise, he's only in it because they've got some secrets on him and he would leave if he could. And I said, I know it's difficult for you to believe this, but Tom actually accepts these ideas that L. Ron Hubbard is the greatest human being who ever lived, that David Miscavige is the greatest human being on the planet right now. And that his, the best thing he can do is help Dave save the planet with Scientology. Tom Cruise actually believes these things. So I when you, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, so I'm just, so when you are, when you're wondering how they can accept things that from the outside are just simply wrong, you know, mistreatment of children, splitting apart families, young women being forced to have abortions. You know, you need to see it from their perspective that these are just some minor problems that are part of this major goal of save, literally saving the planet. And they're gonna just brush off these, these uh, sort of concerns because they've got to keep their eye on the goal. You know, money does amazing things for people because everyone has a price. Um, it does really reek of domestic violence vibes, you know, and to, you know, Joey, for you to say, you know, you know, you're five one, it's going to happen once and then I'm going to kick your ass. Well, that's great. But, you know, it, as someone who is familiar with domestic violence and grew up in that kind of household environment, it's very easy to just take the path of least resistance and to forgive and forget to move on to get along. So it's, it's not even so much that, you know, yes, these atrocities are happening, but the alternative is so much worse. So if I just kind of bend and sway this way, maybe my day will go better than the person that stands up. That's, that's very true. And I understand where you're coming from, but this is not a domestic violence issue. This is somebody with a power trip who is in a fruity little science club and he's five one and I'm six foot is a little different. It's not my daddy. Now my daddy's five, seven, I'm bigger than my daddy. And my daddy hits me. I'm not going to hit him back. Just out of respect. This guy right here hits me. He'll, he'll probably get away with it one time. If I'm really brainwashed into the Scientology, but you're not the brainwash out of my head. <laughs> Next time you put your hands on me. Now, that's just me being honest. I'm, I'm not trying to be tough. Anybody who knows me knows I'm not a tough guy. And I'm not trying to portray myself as a tough guy. I just know me. That's, that's all I'm trying to say. That, that's just me. <laughs> you had mentioned earlier that, you know, the, the government really doesn't want to get involved. 
And, you know, the way I look at it is, yes, these infractions are happening and yes, these crimes are being committed, you know, with any large organization, at most you're going to have an abuse of power. At worst, you're going to have Scientology. Because they have those financial resources and because they're embedded in so many places, do you, does it really bother you that the government doesn't make it a priority when there are so many other things that are pressing? Right. And that's always, that's always an argument that, you know, uh, Scientology is a relatively small organization. Uh, why, you know, are you arguing that resources that could go to much larger problems be taken away? I understand that argument. Um, I think that, um, however, for example, let me give you an example. There's a Los Angeles church, Christian church, that was um, basically smuggling in people over the border in order to turn them into slaves, essentially. Um, and we're, you know, it's a small, very small organization, just one little church. The IRS raided them. The federal government threw those preachers into jail and they're prosecuting them. And that's a tiny little church. So the government understands that a church should not be harming people. And even though this is a relatively small organization with maybe only 20,000 members around the world, it's an organization that has tax exempt status that is costing the government millions and even billions of dollars over the years. So I do think that uh, under normal circumstances, the government should have the resources to take on an organization like this, investigate it if it finds wrongdoing, put people in prison because that's what the government does. But it's not a normal situation. First of all, the IRS has been decimated in the last 20 years and doesn't have the resources to take on something like this. Second of all, Scientology is not just any old church. It's got these attorneys and resources. And so this is, this is really what's going on. It's not that Scientology isn't violating its agreement. It's not that it's not breaking the law. Again, you have these government officials who have to make that calculation. Do we really want to dedicate several years of our lives to taking this down? And at this point, they need to hear more from the public. They need to hear that the public's outraged, but you're right. You know, it, it's, some people feel like it's just not a big enough problem. I think it's, you know, I, I, I deal with these families that are going through this year after year of being split apart, people being extorted. I feel for them and I think that they deserve justice, but I do understand what you're saying that the government's resources are limited. Or maybe we just eliminate tax breaks for church all across the board and level. Well, that's, a, that's another <laughs> argument. That's an interesting argument. You're right. Uh, I mean, I, you know, the whole purpose of tax exemption for churches is that, you know, we pay our taxes so the government can then help out people and we can keep things going and plug some holes here and there, make sure the social fabric is okay. And the government can't be everywhere all the time, but these churches serve some of those purposes in some areas they do feed the poor, they help people, families keep together. So let's give them a tax break so they can sort of provide those services and we don't have to pay for them. And that makes a certain amount of sense. But Scientology is not providing anything like that. Scientology is using the tax exempt, Scientology is using its tax, tax breaks, the money from that, in order to hire private investigators to harass people. I mean, they were paying... I don't know, Joey, you tell me if this is a good rate or not. They were, they were paying this father and son PI team $10,000 a week cash to follow one person, the, the leader's father, Ron Miscavige. The first, um, company, the first company I ever worked for was paying me $14 an hour. Yes, it's, it's, but, it's, good, it's good money. So this will it's be your last episode as he goes and takes a new job. <laughs> right. But that, where do they have, to, why do they have $10,000 a week for private investigators? The tax breaks they get from the tax exempt status. Is that really why churches should have tax exempt status? Of course not. But again, it's just difficult to get the government to review that. It's difficult well, to get the government to do anything. That's why the LDS has a crystal palace. Okay, we're getting into some un. 
uncharted territories here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a special interview with the one and only Tony Ortega. Tony, you got anything you want to plug real fast? Well, just please come to TonyOrtega.org, the underground bunker. We have a new story every morning at 7 a.m. Eastern. And uh, you can see my books that are there. The Unbreakable Miss Lovely is my book about Paulette Cooper. I hope you come by. We have an amazing commenting crew that's in there every day. There, I have people who comment on the site that were in Scientology 30 or 40 years and know much more about it than I do. So we have really hey, wonderful conversations there. One last thing about Paulette Cooper. Uh, I don't think we told the audience that she Scientology actually tried to frame her for crimes she didn't commit, even broke into her uh, office or her, her home and actually wrote stuff on her laptop, not laptop, but typewriter, because this was back in the 70s, 80s, am I correct? Right, right. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that's how low down this organization is. And thank God we got people like Leah Wimney, uh, Tony Ortega, and Mark uh, Mark Remney, is that his name? My, Mike Rinder. Mike Ryan, Rinder, and other people stepping up and, and telling them about this organization that is really brainwashing a lot of people because if we didn't have these people, this, this, I think their goal is, I think their end game is to take over the world. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I really do. I really, I was in New York two years ago, staying at the Paramount and right that, across the street, you see a big sign with Hamilton on it. And next, right next door, you see Scientology. That's right. Yeah, I mean, and then you go, and they go in a bunch of different places. But with that said, we got people like Tony who's really stepping up and making sure that, hey, look, do not get involved with this organization because what they are is a fruity little science club and nobody likes them. With that said, Jacqueline, great job today, girl. You are natural. Real fast, do you uh, have anything you want to plug real fast? Uh, just the opportunity to get to spend time with you and do stuff like this. This is something very different for me, and it's been a lot of fun. Um yeah, right now it's wedding season, so I'm kind of head down and going. Well, I got to say the pleasure and the honor was all mine, of course. And Tony, I humbly thank you for just coming on. Uh, you're a very important figure, and not only in journalism, but in the the person trying to get the word out for Scientology and trying to end this organization. And I thank you so much. Stay online, everybody else. Next time we have a special interview, this has been Joey. This has been Jacqueline. We'll see you next time.